Hello and welcome. This is Contemporary Philosophy and I'm Mark Thorsby. In the next 15 videos or so, what we're going to be taking a look at is a brief sketch of the basic framework that I think would be helpful for students to understand contemporary philosophy. Now when we talk about contemporary philosophy, there's many different things we could talk about because there's so many philosophers today who are writing really great, excellent work. Many of them I know and many of them I don't know. So there's really a whole ocean of people we could be talking about in contemporary philosophy. What I've chosen to do in this video series is really introduce you to two of the key, uh, let's put it this, two of the most important trains of philosophical thought that occur within the 20th century. Roughly, look at um, some of the central figures within analytic philosophy and then some of the central figures within continental philosophy. In particular, uh, we're going to begin by looking at Frege, who is a mathematician and who ultimately is also the father of first order um, quantificational logic, but um, he also was really essential in terms of introducing the, the analysis of language that we see come forward in, in the work of Ludwig Wittgenstein, who's probably the most important thinker of the, 20, of the 20th century. At least that's my view. I don't know if that's really true or not, but um, you know everyone has to stake a claim somewhere. And I think Wittgenstein is very important because he represents um, a really a turning point in modern philosophy um, through an analysis of language. And all of that begins with Frege. In fact, that's what we're going to be taking a look at in this video today. But um, another train of thought we're going to take a look at begins with Edmund Husserl, and we'll start looking at his work next week. Edmund Husserl is the father of phenomenology, but like Frege, he was a mathematician, and he was ultimately interested in articulating a defense of logic um, that's actually in many ways very sympathetic or comparable to the work of Frege. But Husserl's work was very important because it set the stage for uh, the work of Martin Heidegger, who's a famous existentialist and who really centralizes the classic philosophical, problem, philosophical problems around the problem of being. So we're going to look a lot at Heidegger's work as well. Um, and then after that, there's so many other things we're going to take a look at. But one of the, the thinkers that I'm excited to look at is going to be um, Jean Paul Girard in his book Simulations, who I sort of see him as the as a sort of um, a signpost for what the postmodern might be. So that's sort of what we're going to take a look at in this course. We're going to really begin at the in the beginning of contemporary philosophy by looking at the work of, the, of Frege in the late 19th century and early 20th century. And then next week we'll look at Husserl in the early part of the 20th century. Then we're going to take a look at Wittgenstein and Heidegger. Then we're going to look at some a couple other thinkers after them, um, ending with the work of Jean Baudrillard. So hopefully this will be valuable and hopefully... Um, this will be helpful. So let's go ahead and begin our discussion on Frege now. So welcome back, everyone. Um, Gottlob Frege. Now, he, I sort of put him here, he is very important in terms of the philosophy of mathematics, the philosophy of mind and logic. So he's very, very important. He's interested. Um, he actually was a mathematician init initially, uh, but ultimately his work extends to almost all of the domains of philosophical uh, work that we see. So, number one, he was the inventor of modern quantificational logic. Um, if you want to, if you're not familiar with quantificational logic, you can get a brief introduction by taking a look at my uh, playlist on the introduction of formal logic, looking in section eight and later, uh, which is not a full-fledged uh, analysis of quantificational logic, but it is a general introduction you can take a look at. In fact, uh, you can also take a look at. Um, I have another video in which. Uh, I discussed the way the the way in which Frege's work ultimately is can be understood as a response within the history of the development of logic. So Frege is very very important with regard to that. He's also a famous proponent of logicalism. Logicalism is the idea that mathematical truths are ultimately at root logical truths. So there's a great debate within the history within in the late 19th century and within the history of mathematics and the philosophy of mathematics which is namely this, which is, is mathematics, are mathematics and logic doing the same thing, right? So in mathematics, we have quantities and we articulate patterns of relationship between quantities as well as functions of relations for quantities. And, there's, and that's probably a not a very precise definition at all for mathematics. But mathematics is, is essentially looking at these formal features and relationships within uh, various quantities. Now, in logic which is the analysis of argumentation and ultimately the analysis of how we can articulate true arguments, 
well, we, there's a question which is, well, is the mathematician and is, and is the logician ultimately doing the same thing? Keep in mind here that if we're looking within the grand arc of the history of philosophy, one of the things we'll notice is that there's been a long discussion going all the way back to Plato regarding the relationship between philosophy and mathematics. So Frege's view ultimately is that mathematics is based upon logic. So this is known as logicalism. And in fact, his most important work articulated a script and in a mechanism for understanding uh, logical relations and being able to formalize them in both their subject and their predicate variations, and then ultimately to use that as a way to articulate the basic definition for mathematical concepts. Um, there's other uh, people who fall within the camp of logicalism. Probably most famously is going to be Bertrand Russell, as well as Whitehead, in his in their famous Principia Mathematica. Um, so one of, the, one of the other things is that we'll see that Frege is a critic of a psychologism, and we're going to define that in a little bit. But what we can say is that psychologism is the view that ultimately the laws of mathematics and the laws of logic are ultimately derivative of psychological laws or psychological structures. So he's a critic of that view, and he's also a critic of the view of formalism, uh, which is namely that um, uh, of mathematical formalism. I won't go into it because it's going to take me too long to talk about it. Uh, but you can take a look at that. Go to the uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, um, and you can learn more about that. Um, he's also, Frege was also highly influential in terms of the development of analytic philosophy, as I mentioned earlier. Some of the major figures within that camp would be Bertrand Russell, Rudolf Carnap, and of course Ludwig Wittgenstein. Uh, but today, there's many, many other um, analytic thinkers, or thinkers within analytic philosophy. And I think many of them today would see um, so maybe what we could say is that Frege introduces what might be called as the, the classic form of analytic philosophy, but ultimately it develops further into today's era. Um, a little bit about the biography and some of his key works. Now, I put a little picture here. His most important book is probably the bigger shrift, um, or the concept script, and we'll talk about that at some point here. Um, but Frege was born in 1848, roughly the mid-19th century. And he died in roughly the first third of the 20th century in 1925. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> now, Frege was a German. He was actually born in Wismar, Germany. Um, and his parents, had, when he was a kid, his parents both ran a private girls' school. I believe both his mother and his father served as principal of that school at some point. Um, so he was, you know, so and he was also Lutheran. In terms of his sort of religious man, he's very conservative in his own political views. Uh, but he entered university uh, in 1869 at the University of Vienna. But only two or th in three short years later, he transferred to the University of Gottingen um, in 1871. In 1873, his dissertation for which he received his PhD was on a geometrical representation of imaginary figures in a plane. So he's through and through a mathematician, and his PhD is in mathematics, not philosophy, notably. But his most important contributions, of course, occur both mathematics, but I would say principally logic. In 1879, he published the concept script, or the Begriffschrift, which effectively articulated a mechanism for doing something that no one had been able to do since, well, no one has ever been able to do until Frege was able to do that. And that is to figure out a way to um, create a formalized um, script or a formalized system by which you could articulate the logical relationships, not just between propositions, which Leibniz has actually done some work in that, um, and, not, and not just uh, and not just in, just in terms of categorical relationships, such as the categorical logic in Aristotle, but notably what Frege does is he combines both. So he creates a, a, a script that essentially um, brings together propositional logic as well as categorical logic. So uh, it's a pretty remarkable thing. We're not going to really talk about it, what that system looked like in this video. I will say it's very... <laughs> Very interesting and brilliant, um, it, but it's also difficult to understand potentially, uh, but it's definitely worth taking a look at. In 1884, he published The Foundations of Arithmetic, which set out to articulate precisely his view of logicalism, as we mentioned before. Some of the other key works, he, some of the other key papers and things that he wrote include his essay, Function and Concept, Sense and Reference on Concept of Object. Uh, as well as, this, uh, uh, I think I believe it was a, 
the basic laws of arithmetic, which combine a number of different things together. Um, we're going to see today, we're going to look at sense and reference, but we're also going to take a look at, in our video today, a real close reading of Frege's essay on thought and what it is thinking is. So it's very interesting. Um, uh, one thing I should say is that in, by 1902, Bertrand Russell actually proved that there was a contradiction within Frege's system. It was quite sad because what it ultimately meant is that because of Russell's paradox, um, Frege was forced to recognize that his entire Begriffsschrift, and as well as his work in the foundations of arithmetic, had been invalidated. Um, and unfortunately, he was never really able to come back and, you know, be able to prove, uh, or he was never able to come back and prove logicalism, as was his goal. So it's kind of sad, actually. Um, in 1918, Frege retired, and then by 1925, he died. Um, there has been, a just mention of it here, is that there has been quite a bit of ethical criticism against Frege. Despite Frege's mathematical genius and obviously his importance in terms of the history of logic, um, Frege was also very anti-Semitic and very uh, socially conservative for his day. Um, and so, for instance, he advocated um, a number of things which were highly anti-Semitic and ultimately, sadly, seemed to be indicative of what would come um, just 10 years after his death which is the Holocaust. So there is some ethical criticism worth uh, thinking about with regard to Frege's biography. We're not going to take a look at that, that in this video, and that's because we're really just interested in terms of his philosophy regarding logic. So, But that is worth mentioning, and um, it's really too bad, to be honest. Um, so let's start off with some background and some context, right? And this sense gives you a sense of the way in which I'm understanding and the way I'm going to present contemporary philosophy. Contemporary philosophy is, like all philosophy, is really an investigation into meaning. And what does it mean for things to have meaning, right? Um, and we're going to see is that, for instance, whenever we talk about things having meaning, we articulate them in terms of language. That is, we articulate our ideas in terms of propositions, which this seems to mean that meaning is itself a problem with regards to language. Um, so, this is the way in which I want you to see the, or I want, this is one potential framework by which we can understand the history of philosophy within the, from the 19th century into the 20th century and leading up to postmodernism. Ultimately, I'm, we're not going to, this isn't a philosophy on postmodernism, but what I want to do in this, uh, in this sets of videos on contemporary philosophy is show you how a common set of problems regarding language ultimately develop in two different traditions in analytic and continental philosophy leading up towards what we might consider to be some of the characteristics of postmodern philosophy. Uh, there also is what's known as post-analytic philosophy as well. Um, so the way I've seen it, as I mentioned before, is that within the analytic train, we're starting with Frege today, and we're going to sort of move our way towards Wittgenstein. And in continental philosophy, eventually we're going to look at Husserl next week, and then eventually we'll take a look at Heidegger's work. Now, back to Frege, one of the things that's worth mentioning here is the importance that um, another mathematician played within the development of Frege's logical system. And I'm not going to go through this because I already have another video on it, and I didn't ask, uh, this is, I didn't include this in the reading, but here's a picture of Georg Cantor, who's the, who developed what's known as, today is known as set theory, um, and he, he spent his life trying to develop it. What is set theory? Well, set theory is the analysis of um, infinity, the mathematical analysis of infinity. This is a picture of a diagonal proof system. I'm not going to go through all of that today, but I should say that if you're a mathematician or you're studying mathematics, that ultimately Frege's logical work is really predicated upon the mathematical work of Georg Cantor, who sadly was um, essentially uh, ostracized from the mathematical community uh, in, for, uh, during his time period. But ultimately his work is so important uh, that even though he, his public career, while he was alive, he wasn't recognized for his genius. Georg Cantor is very, very important, and he ultimately helped build the tool set that Frege would use in order to articulate um, his own quantificational logic. And in fact, as I mentioned before, there's Russell's paradox. My view is that ultimately Russell's paradox is derivative of the same paradox that Georg Cantor faced in his development 
of the continuum hypothesis. So that's something if you're interested in, you can take a look at and do further research on. So like I said, today's discussion is on this problem of meaning. Here are some of the problems that we're going to see Frege begin to discuss and they're ultimately relevant to our discussion today. One moment. The first is what is truth? <laughs> no small question there. What is a thought? What does it mean to think? What is an idea? Right? What is an idea? How is that different from having a thought? Are they the same thing or not? Where do these thoughts and ideas come from, for instance? Um, some of our ideas seem to come from us, and some of our thoughts seem to come from others. So where exactly do our thoughts come from? In other words, another way of asking the same question is to ask, well, are our thoughts and our ideas made, or are they discovered? So is, for instance, like when you're learning, for instance, the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, one of the questions you could ask is, what exactly are you learning? Are you learning something that was constructed by humans or something that was discovered about nature by humans? So what exactly is the mathematician doing? And of course, what is the logician and the philosopher doing? It's a very, very important question. Now, another question here is, why is it that we can say the same thing in different ways? This is another sort of interesting problem. Um, and of course, related to that, we'll see, is the question of what exactly is the sense of a word? You'll frequently, we'll see in Wittgenstein, you free, talk about nonsense later in the course, and frequently you hear people talk about the sense, of, whether or not something is sense, uh, makes sense, right? Well, what is sense? So that's going to be one of the things we're going to see Frege address. Now, we're going to start off, and you're going to see that I'm going to talk first, and I'm going to spend most of my time on this essay, which is, which is translated as The Thought, A Logical Inquiry by Gottlob Frege. It was published between 1918 and 1919 in German. Um, the version that I'm actually going to be using here was published in the, um, in the journal Mind from volume 65 and uh, number 259 uh, from 1956. Um, and if you want, you can find this essay, the full text of it, through JSTOR if you have that, if, you're, if you have access to that. Um, so that's the essay we're going to spend most of our time looking at. And then we're also going to take a look at another essay I'm looking for. I don't see it, but which is um, Sense and Reference. But I'm not going to spend as much time on that essay as I am on this one. And that's partially because I really like this essay. It comes, this essay was written fairly late in Husserl's life, but um, it really in many ways lays down a nice beginning point to begin to understand what some of the central ideas, concepts, and problems are for um, a philosophy of language and a philosophy that, that seeks to articulate the conditions by which meaning is possible. So let's sort of go through it here. And you're going to see, I'm um, actually, if you follow along the text, I've, I, of course, I can't discuss everything. Oops. I can't discuss everything that's in the text um, because there's so much stuff that Frege talks about. We wouldn't have time to do so. But I am trying my best to follow the text fairly closely. Um, and so if you are reading the text, you will notice that I'm following through really the very structure of Frege's argument without little variation, or with little variation. So let's start with this, is that logic, uh, logic is, a philo is, a, is the science of argumentation or the science of truth, we're going to see is what Frege thinks. Um, and Frege, but Frege has to understand what exactly does that mean. Because if logic is the science of truth, what exactly is truth, right? He says, for instance, you can compare aesthetics um, or ethics, um, I throw aesthetics twice, um, or physics, for instance. So, for instance, physics is really interested in articulating what is nature is, right, in terms of material nature. Aesthetics is interested in articulating what the beautiful is, and ethics is ultimately oriented towards the good. Well, in the very same way that each of those sciences, the science of nature, the science of the beautiful, the science of action, of good action, that each of these sciences has an object towards which they're directed, essentially. Uh, a principle that organizes their um, that organizes all their work, and for logic that is truth. So logic is ultimately concerned with the laws of truth. So what we can say is that logic is the analysis of argument is the about the science of argumentation for making good arguments. Well, what is a good argument? A good argument is one in which if you if the premises of the argument are true then the conclusion will necessarily true follow as being true as well. This is known as the validity of an argument. And then, of course, it's not just that. There's a second criteria, right? It's not just the truth functionality of an argument that makes it good, but it's also the fact that an argument really does relate to the truth. 
right? It's that is sound argumentation. Again, take a look at the introduction to formal logic videos I posted in which I explained some of these concepts. But logic ultimately is concerned with the laws of truth. So what exactly is a law, right? Well, there's two different ways in which we can understand a law, right? On the one way is to say that you have laws in which conformity is non-essential. And when I say non-essential, that is the law can exist without people obeying the law, right? Um, so for instance, it's illegal to steal someone else's property. But strictly speaking, that law can exist even if people don't follow it, right? That would be a good state of affairs, but it would be something that's at least conceivable, right? The other way in which we can talk about laws when we think when we talk, for instance, about laws of nature. And in this sense, a law is something that's concerned universally. Let's put it this way. A law, um, in this sense, is one in which their universal conformity is essential. So, for instance, the law for the, for the conservation of energy, for instance. That law is a natural law in the sense that no one can break it, right? Everyone, is, ha, everyone lives and all motion is governed according to that principle. Um, so, you have these two types of laws. So, we can ask ourselves, well, what kind of law is ultimately logic interested in, right? Well, for one, one way in which we can begin to, to answer that question is to recognize, or we'll see that for Frege, the laws of truth are not psychological. So he ultimately, uh, the laws of truth are not psychological in the sense that they're not simply derived from the fact that the mind works in the way it does, right? Um, he says, quote, the assertion both of what is false and of what is true takes place in accordance with psychological laws. So you can say here is that uh, law in this first sense would be a sort of psychologism, but law in this bottom sense, law in which there's universal conformity, really seems to be the type of laws that um, of truth that logic is interested in articulating. That is the universal, unchanging, timeless laws that govern how truth functions within our statements and within our language. So what we see here is that we see the emergence right from the very beginning of this essay of anti-psychologism. And we're going to see that anti-psychologism is a theme for the early 20th century philosophers. And in particular, the two philosophers that we're looking at here, Frege, obviously, it's important to him. But we'll also see Husserl is equally concerned with articulating arguments against psychologism. Uh, for which he was actually himself accused of doing. Uh, so that's sort of, sort of important. So let's begin with this. What does it mean to say something is true? Well, we know that when, first, if we look it up in the dictionary, what we can say is that the word true is an adjective, right? An adjective is a word that describes something else, right? It describes a subject, or describes a noun, rather, or a noun phrase. So that means that to say that something is true is, in a way, to describe something. Well, wait a second. How does truth come into the equation here as an adjective, right? Because see, so let's start off. For instance, someone might say this is true of picture X. So here's a picture of Abraham Lincoln. And what I'm going to say is this is Abraham Lincoln. And many of you will probably agree, nod your head, and say that's true, right? So ask ourselves in this case, are, when we say that uh, this is a true picture of Abraham Lincoln, what is it we're saying? Well, there's a first possibility that we're going to see Frege rejects, but that first possibility is to say, well, this is this is a true picture of Abraham Lincoln, only insofar as this is what Abraham Lincoln actually looked like. So in other words, what we're talking about here is the idea that truth equals representation, or correct representation. Or in other words, the truth is a form of correspondence. Now, this is actually known, and this has been a theory that can be articulated at least since the time of uh, Rene Descartes, but even earlier. And this is the what we might call the correspondence theory of truth, right? So what we can say is that this picture of Abraham Lincoln is a true picture of Abraham Lincoln only insofar as it corresponds to A being a picture of B, Abraham Lincoln, okay? So that means, or what it means seems to suggest is that truth is some sort of relation, right? Truth is a relation between the picture and the actual thing itself. In this case, there being a there being Abraham Lincoln, right? The the representation of Abraham Lincoln. Okay, so if truth is a relation of correspondence, what exactly is correspondence? And here's where things get messy, right? Perfect correspondence. If we were to try to figure out what it means for things to correspond perfectly, then what we'd say is that correspondence occurs when things coincide and are therefore not distinct from each other at all, right? So think about two 
twin brothers, right? The two twin brothers uh, have a correspondence in their DNA, right? What does that mean? It means that they effectively have the same DNA. Or in other words, they're not distinct. The DNA itself, the sequencing, is not itself distinct between the two twins. So perfect correspondence occurs when things coincide that are therefore not distinct. Notice, for instance, if I say 2 plus 2 equals 4, or I say 5 minus 1 equals 4, there is a way in which both of those things, um, the, the, let's put it, the solution for both of those uh, formulas, right, the number 4 is identical, right? Those two things have perfect correspondence. The number 4 in the first equation and the number 4 in the second one, they're not distinct at all. So that's maybe an example, for instance, of perfect correspondence. The problem, though, is does that work when we talk about language, when we talk about logic? Well, for ultimately for Frege, no, it doesn't. There's a major problem. He writes that truth can't be a feature of correspondence between things because things are objects, right? But objects can't be correspondent. So, for instance, he gives the example of, for instance, if you uh, are trying to... Uh, let me see if I can zoom in here. Oh. Uh, Frege gives the example of if, you, if you're buying something, right? So let's imagine you're 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 gonna trade in an ounce of gold and you want money. So what I did is I actually went to Google, I typed it in, and this is today's at least as of this video, the price uh, for how much an ounce of gold is worth, right? And you can see that as for today, an ounce of gold is worth thirteen hundred dollars and thirty thirteen thirty four one thousand three hundred thirty four dollars and seventy cents. Sorry, it's, my throat's kill, killing me today, so I'm sorry about that. Um, so you can see that that's the price of gold today. So if I give you a, um, uh, an ounce of gold and you give me $1,300 here, right? Then what we can, and you give me that exact amount, what we can say is that there's a, a, a perfect exchange between the two according to this rate, which means that they correspond with each other. But you can see immediately here is how exactly can an ounce of gold um, correspond with money in truth as being $1,334 and 70 cents. You can see, because an ounce of gold is a piece of metal, and the rest of this is a check, or uh, maybe it's a, it's a pile of cash with some with some coins, right? You can ask yourself, how do those two things correspond with each other? And you can see here is that truth is not an idea that corresponds to reality. That doesn't mean that in truth, that there isn't truth in reality, but it means that truth is, an, is not an idea that corresponds to reality. Um, because if it were, there'd only be half-truths, for instance. Um, the correspondence theory of truth, Frege argues, ultimately collapses because truth is not a condition about the physical world, right? Truth is about something else, right? Consider that when someone says something, con consider the case that if someone said something, you replied by saying that is true. What exactly is going on here? What we're going to begin to see is that, um, is that well, what we're going to see is that it's not the sentence that's true, but it's the sense of the sentence that's true, right? So if I tell you that Donald Trump is the current president of the United States, and he is the current president of the United States, you're going to say that's true. But notice here, you're not saying that my sentence is true. You're saying that Donald Trump being the president is what's true. So it's the sense of the sentence, not the sentence itself that's true, right? Now, so this is this notion of sense, right? Well, what's a sentence? A sense is merely a series of, of sounds that have a sense. But what is a sense? It, or in other words, is the sense of a sentence an idea? And this is a question we're going to look at. But what we're going to see is that the truth conditions, um, or truth, is ultimately related to the sense of what we say, not to the actual words we say. Um, and it's related to the world in some way. Okay, and here's a, here's a quote from Frege. He says, truth is not a quality that corresponds with a particular type, kind of sense impression. So we all have sense impressions of the world, but notice that when you look at the world, you never have a sense impression of truth or of the world being true, right? Truth seems to come after market, as it were, um, after, after our sense impressions of the world are um, fulfilled in our intuition. Uh, in that same passage, uh, Frege says that being true is not a material, perceptible property. Nothing actually gets added to a thing when we prescribe truth to it, right? Um, so, for instance, when I say that it's true that Donald Trump is the current president of the United States, I haven't added anything to the world. 
I haven't said anything that would give me more knowledge about Donald Trump or the presidency. Um, really, all I've done by saying that that statement is true is I've done it. Well, what have I done? That's ultimately going to be the difficulty here. What we can say is that one, on the one hand, when we talk about sentences, because all of our statements about the world, about the truth, about things we consider to be true or things we consider to know, all come in the form of language and in the form of sentences. So sentences always communicate and state something is the case, right? We're going to see that this is ultimately what a proposition is, but what we can say is that the indicative sentence always indicates something. Pretty straightforward. That's why we call it indicative sentence, indicative, because it indicates, right? So what we can do, therefore, when we recognize that what we're talking about are indicative sentences, because only indicative sentences, or in, in the general sense, only indicative sentences are, um, can be said to be true or false. Right? And whenever you have a sentence, you have two components. If you have the assertion, which is the statements and the words you use, but you also have the content, which is really what we might say is the thought of what you're talking about. Right? So if I say a triangle has three sides, notice that I can say that in many different ways. I can give you a different type of assertion. I can say three sides does a triangle have, for instance. But both of those sentences, despite them having different types of assertions, being different assertions or being different forms of statements, they both have the same content. And this is ultimately what he thinks a thought is. The thought is the content we have of things. Um, well, I missed a, a thing here. One thing I do want to mention here is that Frege will only consider propositional sentences. So he's not going to think about questions or imperatives or other non-assertive forms of language. He knows that language does all of these things and not every statement in language is ultimately by subject to the bivalent property of being either true or false. So when I ask you the question, what's your name, there's no true or false that goes along with that kind of sentence. So just keep in mind here that we're only thinking about these indicative type of sentences, sentences where I say that um, the, 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 um, the grass is green or um, there, it's raining outside. These are all indicative sentences that could be true or false. Now, there's something else important, since now we're talking about thought, we're talking about thinking, we have to recognize that whenever we talk about thinking, there's really three elements to the distinction we have to be concerned with. On the one hand, there's the apprehension of a thought, and that's what uh, Frege calls thinking. Number two is there's the recognition of the truth of a thought, which is the judgment. And then finally, there's the manifestation of this judgment, which is an assertion. So, for instance, go back to the example I gave, and if I say that, Donald Trump is the current president of the United States. To understand what it is I'm suggesting is to have a thought, is to think, that's to have a thought. To recognize that that's a true statement is to make a judgment. And then to manifest that judgment in a way by saying it is true that Donald Trump is the current president of the United States, that is to articulate an assertion. So we have these sort of three levels that Frege is suggesting that we bifurcate the discussion along which is thinking, judgment, and assertion, okay? Um, in fact, on 294 here of the MIND uh, article, uh, Frege articulates the idea that the recognition of truth is always declared in the form of an indicative sentence, right? So Frege is going to engage in a discussion of poetry at some point, actually, because he, he thinks poetry is kind of interesting, because in poetry you have language, but you don't quite have truth conditions of language, even if... Poetry uses um, indicative types of sentences, right? So you can imagine in poetry, um, someone might say, love is, um, you know, a, a flower growing in the sun. That's a terrible poem, but, or whatever. If someone says something like that, it's an indicative type sense, but it doesn't quite have the same register of truth conditions of the type of statements he's interested in. And he says, for instance, the humanities, the arts, these things... They do discuss and engage with truth, and they have truth conditions, but really they're forms of language which arouse feeling more than they assert the truth of things. So for instance, if someone says, thank God, imagine you hear someone praying and they say, thank God. What we see there is that that kind of statement arouses a feeling. It doesn't assert something's the case. And in fact, he goes on to say at 295, quote, what are called the humanities are more closely connected with poetry and are therefore less scientific than the exact sciences, which are drier the more the exact they are. For exact science is directed towards truth and only the truth. 
Okay, so you can see here is that Frege, like a good thinker, is whittling down what it is he's ultimately talking about here. Um, and language does so many things that he can't quite. Um, he can't. He has to restrict the logic, the logical analysis of language in this way, in order for it to be meaningful. And as he's doing so, he starts making these very interesting um, critiques about the humanities and the sciences, and so so on and so forth. Um, in two ninety six, Husserl add, not Husserl, I'm sorry, Frege adds that the contents of a sentence often go beyond the thoughts that are expressed by it, and he even also says that sometimes our sentences actually fail to grasp the thought of the matter as well. So there's a way in which our assertions sometimes, our sentences, sometimes go beyond the thought we have. And there's also times in which our sentences can't quite grasp or capture the thought we have. So there's sort of interesting sense of thought of what he thinks a thought is here. And we're going to see him distinguish that in a little bit here from ideas. But there's another consideration worth mentioning. And that is that context matters, right? So the same sentence can mean two different things in two different contexts. Now this is an example I've put in here, of course. This is not Frege's example. But take, for example, the, the, the sentence, Lincoln fights for justice. Well, here is Abraham Lincoln, who I'm talking about. And I say that Abraham Lincoln fights for justice. You probably have an idea about what that means, right? That... He fought to end slavery, um, and he fought for the Constitution, and so on and so forth, of the United States. Now, that's what, Now, notice that that statement, because I've shown you this picture, has a specific context. But what if I show you this context, right? And I say, Lincoln fights for justice. If you're not familiar with what this is, this is a sort of B-rated movie that came out a number of years ago called Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter in which Abraham Lincoln with his big axe, you know, goes into the woods at night outside of Washington, D.C., and he fights vampires. So if there was a character, for instance, in the movie that said, Lincoln fights for justice, in this context, you would think that Lincoln actually fighting for justice means not freeing the slaves or fighting for the U.S. Constitution, but it means stopping demons and um, killing vampires, right? So you can see here is that context actually matters quite a bit to how we understand the statements that we make in language. Now, this is where what, um, in order to articulate what a thought is, Frege recognized that it's very important for him to distinguish a thought from this notion of an idea. So what does he mean by an idea? Well, here, recall that in modern philosophy, there's a classic distinction here between the subjective and the objective. This goes all the way back to the philosophy of Rene Descartes, in which Descartes, for instance, articulates the idea that I think, therefore I am, cogito ergo sum, right? And then Descartes' entire goal was therefore to then, beginning with the subjective, get to the objective. And in modern and he which wasn't successful. And this is a classic distinction between inner and outer. So we have ideas in our mind which are only ours, right? It's it's their their presentations and. What Frege wants to say is that the word idea, he wants to reserve for the inner subjective experience and consciousness that we have, right? Or when he says a thought, he's thinking of that as being something that's going to be ultimately objective. So the idea is inner. He says on 299, ideas cannot be seen or touched. They cannot be smelled, nor tasted, nor heard. And not just because you can't see or touch or hear them. Uh, it's because they're always subjective. So in a certain way, everyone always and only has their own ideas about the world. And what Frege wants to articulate here is that logic isn't about the structure of the ideas we have. Logic is ultimately about articulating the truth conditions for the thoughts we have, where a thought is not the same thing as an idea. So let's go through his, his discussion of ideas here. Imagine you go on a walk with someone through the park or on a, a baseball field or something. And you, you see green grass, you see the trees, you're both experiencing greenness, you're seeing green things, but you don't actually know that the other person's green is the same green you see, right? Think of these problems about colorblindness, for instance, or think about um, John Locke's discussion of primary and secondary qualities of perception, right? But what we can say here is that while I'm walking with my wife in the park and I'm seeing the green field, that... Both of us are seeing the same thing, but I don't know that her idea of the green is the same as my idea of green. Maybe her green is really my blue and so on and so forth. So we can say here is that we have different ideas, right? Now, 
what we have to do is then articulate. So number one, ideas and thoughts are not the same thing. And ideas are inner and subjective. But number two, that means that ideas are always had. Or in other words, ideas are something that someone experiences. They belong to the content of someone's consciousness, right? So you don't, so for instance, you could say is that when you go to a library and you just look at the books, you're not looking at a catalog of ideas, right? The only way in which you can have ideas is if you read the book, right? And you generate within your consciousness um, these things we call ideas, right? Um, ideas, number three, need a bearer. So that means that since ideas are had, they have, there has to be someone who actually bears those ideas. And here's the example of colorblindness. That's why I put this sort of red circle, red square here, right? Because if you're colorblind, you may not recognize the difference between red and another color. Now, I'm not too familiar with colorblindness, but what we can say is that red is a state of my consciousness that is really incomparable to that of another person. So I never know what red is like for you. I never know what it's like for me. Um, so whether or not we really have the same ideas about things can actually never be answered in principle. They can't be answered in principle because all of our consciousness is our entire consciousness is populated with ideas, but those ideas are in principle subjective, which means I can never know what your ideas are because if I were to know what your ideas were, well, your ideas would no longer be subjective. They would become objective. So you can see here is that what Frege is doing is he's trying to address um, the discussion of thinking and objectivity in terms of its relationship to modern philosophy and the 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 danger, the worry that all we have are subjective, all we have is subjective knowledge or subjective ideas. So this leads Frege to number four. The idea is that not only are ideas um, had and not only are ideas have a bearer, but they only have one bearer, right? So that means that the no two people can have the same ideas. So the consequence though is that thoughts have to be different from ideas because this means that you and I can have the same, I, I'm sorry, you and I cannot have the same ideas, but what happens, for instance, when we think about the Pythagorean theorem, right? Take a look. Here's the Pythagorean theorem right here. I'm not going to go through it and read it to you and explain it. I'm assuming you know what the Pythagorean theorem is here. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Here's a little geometric proof um, or a demonstrable graphic. But guess what? The Pythagorean theorem is going to be the same for you as it is for me, right? A squared plus B squared equals C squared doesn't mean something different for you, and it doesn't mean something different for me. We know this because, number one, mathematics requires it. And number two, um, we're not sure what that would mean exactly, right? Um, so that means that when we're doing something like learning or thinking about the Pythagorean theorem, we're doing something that goes beyond merely the realm of ideas because it's not merely subjective, it's objective, right? Let's think, for instance, that when you're in your logic class or you're in a mathematics class and everyone's doing a proof, in, let's say you're doing a proof in trigonometry and math, right? Maybe a proof's a bad example, but let's say you're, you're calculating a problem in trigonometry. Everyone's going to get the same answer. Well, why if everyone's ideas are different? Well, it must mean there's a different domain here. Because if ideas were thoughts, then what we would end up with is some type of solipsism. Either on the one hand, we end up with the, the dreaming problem that you see in Descartes. How do I know that not everything I'm experiencing is just a dream that I myself am creating in some sort of mass hallucination, right? Think about this idea while you're watching this video. Maybe you're not actually watching this video. Maybe you were in a car accident and you're actually in a coma, and this is merely a dream. This is the dream problem, and it seems to be a variant of solipsism. On the other hand, there's idealism. In idealism, you can take a look at uh, the work of George Berkeley, who's an early uh, British empiricist idealist. And his argument is that everything is ideas. He argues that the physical world is not physical at all. Uh, the physical world is not populated with things. It's populated with ideas. And the reason Berkeley argued this is because, well, how do I know that all I have are my ideas? I don't know that there's, I'm looking at a computer right now as I'm recording this. Um, I have an idea of a computer in my head. There's an image of it being generated in my consciousness. But how do I know that that idea actually corresponds again to something outside of my head? The answer is I can never know. Um, because all I have are my ideas of the computer. I can never, as it were, climb outside of myself, climb outside of my own skull in order to double check that 
I'm perceiving the world correctly. And so this means that that's one of the consequences if we equated, or let's say equivocated, the concepts of ideas and thought together. And it means that there's really sort of one of two possibilities. Either an idea is an object of awareness, or thoughts are limited to the extent that an idea is or is not possible. Take a look at this quote from uh, page 303 of the essay. He says, Either the thesis that only what is my idea can be the object of my, my awareness is false, or all my knowledge and perception is limited to the range of my ideas to the state, to the state of my consciousness. Um, and in fact, this suggestion seems to be the idea, right? Because it looks like that if, quote, if we call what happens in our consciousness an idea, then we really experience only ideas, but not their causes, right? So, but the fact that there is causes suggests otherwise. And it also suggests this idea that, that whatever laws are implicit for our ideas, because ideas are the means by which we understand the world, they too must also delimit what is possible for our thoughts. So it's quite interesting, right? So what it means is that, uh, and we'll see Edmund Husserl next week really takes up this notion and this suggestion in a full-fledged way in his phenomenology, but we'll talk about that next week. Um, so it's quite interesting. Let's keep going here. So that means, this means that Frege develops ultimate argument against metaphysical idealism. Again, metaphysical idealism is the idea that reality is really populated with nothing other than ideas, right? And if that's the case, there's only one set of ideas you know, and that's your own, right? So here's his argument, though. He says, quote, if everything is idea, then there is no bearer of ideas. If there is no bearer of ideas, then there are also no ideas, for ideas need a bearer without which they can't exist. If there's no ruler, there's also no subjects, by comparison. So the dependence, which I found myself induced to confer on the experience as opposed to the experient or experiencer, is abolished if there is no bearer. So, and this is the part I want to emphasize here, is he says, what I call ideas are then independent objects. Every reason is wanted for granting an exceptional position to that object, which I call I. So there's a very rich passage here, which ultimately uh, articulates a reason why Ideas uh, can't simply be all there is, because if that was the case, then pe there could be people to have those ideas, right? Because people are ideas. They just apprehend or conceive the world with ideas or through ideas or something like this. So the object of a thought is not the content of my consciousness. Now, let's take this back a little bit. Why is this an important insight for Frege to think about here? Well, consider mathematics, right? He's a mathematician. That's his sort of prime target. He wants to defend mathematics against uh, a whole range of potential um, psych versions of psychologism, for instance. But what he wants to argue here is that my thought, um, the object of my thought, isn't the same thing as that which is in my brain, right? Notice here that people frequently sort of say that, right? They'll say that your thought is really just the the electricity that's fire, the neurons firing in your brain. Well, what we might say is that the neurons firing in your brain seem to signify or come along with the content of your consciousness, which is, of course, for instance, your ideas. But that's not the same thing as the Pythagorean theorem. So imagine this: imagine you you are doing brain, you put someone in an MRI machine, and you're watching their brain activity, um, and you ask them to think about the Pythagorean theorem. Well, as the MRI machine takes pictures of their brain activity or whatnot, right? What you'll what you have a picture of maybe is the way in which their brains are manufacturing ideas. But what you don't have is you don't have the object of that thought being taken a picture of, right? Because think, if I'm thinking about the Pythagorean theorem in an MRI machine, well, if you were to capture the object of my thought, well, you should draw a picture of a Pythagorean of a of a right triangle is what you should see, as it were. Um, so this means, this is very important, there's a difference here between consciousness and our states of consciousness as opposed to the objective things that our thoughts are about, right? So one of the things that ultimately he's concerned with doing, Frege, is, is defending uh, logic, right? And the, um, I guess it would be the, uh, the transcendental conditions for logic. Now here's an example, think about a doctor who perceives a patient's pain but can't figure it out, so he goes to another doctor and tells the doctor about the for, about the patient's pain. Well, notice here is that for the patient, there is, the patient has the pain, and the pain is really an idea in the in the patient, right? 
They're experiencing it. The doctor doesn't have the idea of the pain, but they do have a thought of the pain, right? They have the thought of the person's idea. And then when this doctor goes to his, you know, the, the other doctor in order to discuss the, his patient's pain, this doctor has, a th has an idea of this thought of this idea. And ultimately, or in other words, the, the Dr. B has a thought of the patient's pain insofar as it was directed to him through the uh, thoughts of Dr. A. So in other words, the two, all these people have different ideas, but they're all concerned with the same thought, which is the patient's pain. Or in other words, quote, both doctors have the invalid's uh, uh, pain, which they do not bear as their common object of thought. It can be seen from this that not only a thing, but also an idea can be the common object of thought of people who do not have an idea. But not every object of the understanding is an idea because not everything is an idea, right? So what happens then when people understand the same thought? What does that mean exactly for two people to understand the same thought? Well, Frege says, quote, In thinking, we do not produce thoughts, but we apprehend them. For what I have called thoughts stand in the closest relation to truth. Now notice here is that when I say a plus a squared plus b squared equals c squared is true, right? The truth of it isn't grounded in my idea or my concept. The truth of it is grounded in the objective characteristics or qualities related to right angle triangles, right? So the thought stands closer to the truth than the idea. And that means that when I recognize and I understand the Pythagorean theorem, I'm apprehending a thought. I'm not making a thought. And in fact, if we go to that first question we asked at the beginning of the lecture here, which was, are our thoughts discovered or are they made and built or created by us? Um, I think that Frege's answer is quite clear. Of course, we can make we can make up things, but when we're thinking of the Pythagorean theorem and we're talking about indicative sentences that can be true, what we're talking about ultimately is the apprehension of thought, not the creation of an idea. Um, so what is a fact? And think of the way in which we talk about the importance that facts should be the basis upon our decisions. Well, what is a fact? A fact is a thought that is true. A fact is a thought that is true. Um, so it's not internal. You can see here is that Frege is ultimately arguing against any sort of kind of subjectivity, not any sort of subjectivity, but he's ultimately arguing against the uh, subjective framework that is indicative of a psychologism. Now, Frege has a number of commitments that I think are worth mentioning here. The first here, the first two I've just taken directly from his quotes here from the paper, but the first commitment he seems to articulate is that, quote, the work of science does not consist of creation, but of the discovery of true thoughts. So science doesn't create its truths, it discovers them, right? Uh, it, it, in some ways, it's very much wrong to say that Isaac Newton invented uh, the laws of motion. No, we don't say that. We say that Isaac Newton discovered the laws of motion. And he discovered them because they were true regardless of him, regardless of his ideas. Uh, they were always going to be true and always were true. Number two, not everything is an idea, though. Otherwise, psychology would contain all the sciences within it, or at least it would be the highest judge over all the sciences. Otherwise, for instance, psychology would rule over logic and mathematics, which would be quite problematic, right? Um, obviously, there is a relationship between logic and psychology, because one cannot think in log one cannot think logically without certain necessary and sufficient psychological conditions. But psychology is not what the sciences themselves are studying, and ultimately, to understand uh, the Pythagorean theorem is not to understand a psychological idea. It is to understand something about triangles themselves. So number three, what we can say is that thoughts are objectively independent of subjective ideas. Uh, they're objectively independent of subjective ideas. So there is a sort of problem here that we should mention, and that's the notion that we have to remember that thoughts are not real. Uh, and the solution, how can we figure that thoughts are not real in this sense, is that you don't find thoughts in the world, right? You just discover that uh, that that 
President Trump really is the president. Donald Trump really is the president. So thoughts are not real in the way that chairs and cats and people are. So how do we explain the way in which thoughts can have truth? And the answer here is going to relate to what ultimately um, uh, Frege refers to as the timelessness of a thought. So the solution is that the truth of a thought is timeless. Whoops. I want to read you two quotations that come towards the end of his essay here. He said, whoops, let me zoom out just a little bit. He says, and yet, what value could there be for us in the eternally unchangeable, which could, which could neither undergo effects nor have effects on us? Something entirely and in every respect inactive would be unreal and non-existent for us. Even the timeless, if it is to be anything for us, must somehow be implicated with the temporal. What would a thought be for me that was never apprehended by me? But by apprehending a thought, I can come into a relationship or in a relation to it and to me. So it is possible that the same thought that is thought to by me today was not the thought by me yesterday. But in this way, the strict timelessness is, of course, annulled. But one is inclined to distinguish between essential and inessential properties and to regard something as timeless um, if, the ch if the changes it undergoes involve only its inessential properties. So a property of a thought would be called inessential, which consists in or follows from the fact that it's apprehended by the thinker. So when Frege, let me sort of make a little sense of that. Frege's notion here is that consider the idea that the truth of the statement that of the Pythagorean theorem a squared plus b squared equals c squared is timeless. It's always going to be true, be true no matter what because it's ultimately related to these objective characteristics or objects. But also, so, but also consider the fact that when I think a thought, there is a temporal dimension that I introduce. So I can think a thought today that I didn't think about yesterday. But that doesn't mean that the timelessness of it here is is what it. That doesn't mean that the suggestion that the truth um, of a thought is is grounded in the fact that it's a timeless. It's something that's timeless and is independent of the changing conditions of our world, right? Because guess what? What's, I am not an essential element to the Pythagorean theorem. I'm not an essential element to these declarative, indicative senses that express thoughts, right? Just because I'm thinking it doesn't mean that I have to be the one that's thinking it, right? And it doesn't have to occur um, at, in time. So there's this really interesting discussion and in, um, sort of exploration about time that I think is interesting. Let me give you another quote here. He says, quote, thoughts are by no means unreal, but their reality is of, a, is of quite a different kind from that of things. And their effect is brought about by the act of the thinker without which they would be ineffective, at least as far as we can see. And yet the thinker does not create them, but must take them as they are. They can be true without being apprehended by a thinker and are not wholly unreal even then, at least if they could be apprehended and by this means to be brought into operation. And this actually sort of is the concluding thought of Frege's discussion of what a thought is. And so some of the big takeaways for you is to consider that Frege's view is that a thought is distinguished from an idea. A thought can be objective. An idea is only subjective. Um, and that our senses ultimately express thoughts, right? That's sort of the big takeaway here. And, and I want, I'm hoping that this discussion that we've had with Frege here will serve as a nice way to, for you to begin to organize for yourself what some of the basic elements are within the philosophy of language and also organize for you what some of the basic problems within the philosophy of language of what those problems are within the philosophy of language. Now what I want to do next is turn to another essay of Frege's which is called Sense and Reference. It's probably the most famous essay he, he did for the non-logicians. Uh, I'm not going to go through that essay fully but I'm going to try to hone in and articulate what some of those key points are. And it begins really with this question of identity. And notice our words, right? Um, our word, I can use a phrase to talk about something in two different ways. So notice how I can say that uh, I can e either, when I'm talking about a bachelor, I could define a, I could call someone a bachelor or I could call someone an unmarried man and they would mean the same thing, right? Um, so the question there is how does that work, right? there I guess I'm expressing one thought, but I have different sentences, right? I can say that, I can say Joe is a bachelor, or I can say Joe is an unmarried man, right? Both of those have the same thought, 
but they have different ways of going about thinking it. So this sort of raises an interesting question, uh, it, which is ultimately this question of identity. And to be clear, this essay, Sense and Reference, is very important because it also stands as one of, as I mentioned earlier in Frege's work, he develops the Begrisschrift, and then he works on the, uh, the, uh, the very important work, the Foundations for Arithmetic. Uh, but ultimately, and then eventually there's Russell's paradox, which shows that the system he develops in the arithmetic is fails. It's contradictory or paradoxical, right? You can see before Russell's paradox, this essay was written. And I think what we're starting to see in this essay is that Frege is beginning to anticipate some of the, the problematic elements within his logical system. We don't have time to go through that because it's actually quite complex. It will require a long discussion, really, that's related to set theory. Um, so I'm not going to go through that now, but uh, so that's sort of part of the background of this essay. But you can see here is that this essay does have a relationship to the one we just looked at, right? Because we can ask this, the question, how is it that we can have a single thought but multiple ways of talking about it? So in other words, is identity, right? Bachelor, unmarried man, is identity a relation between objects or between signs, right? That is, is identity a relationship between the things in the world, or about the, the words we're using exactly. And here, uh, Frege is fully aware of, of the implications within of the history of philosophy regarding this discussion. <coughs> Excuse me. So for instance, take this relation A equals A. I could say the cat is the cat, right? That's a tautology. And from a Kantian framework, that's a priori, right? Uh, the identity of the cat being the cat is something that is given. You don't have to go look and check whether or not the cat is the cat, right? The cat is always the cat, regardless of your experience of the cat. So that means that a, the type of identity we see in tautologies or tautological statements is always an identity that has an a priori determination. But what about when I say that uh, the cat is Joe? Like maybe I name my cat Joe and I say the cat is Joe. Well, there, I'm creating a synthetic relationship that really takes the form of the structure A equals B, where A is cat and B is Joe, the name Joe. And somehow, I'm synthesizing them together. And, and that requires us to know something uh, that comes from experience. Or in other words, it's a posteriori. So um, we'll, we, we're not going to get into Kant right here. Um, you can take a look at some of my introductory videos on Kant if you like. Uh, but... I want you to know, or at least to recognize here, that Frege is well aware of his position and the, the and where the types of problems he's interested in fit within the history of philosophy. And of course, Kant is a primary element within that. So, okay. If identity is a relation, well, then should A equals A and A equals B actually really say the same thing? Right? Shouldn't the relationship be the same then? Right? And ultimately... We'll see what, well, I'll read this on page 26. And by the way, I should say is that um, the Sense Reference article has been published in many ways. The page numbers I'm giving here come from the original text. Um, so you can look at the, the side pagination. Of course, he wrote this, um, I believe, originally in German. So, But this is the original pagination for the German text. So on page 26 of that text in Sense and Reference, um, Frege says, quote, A difference can arise only if the difference between the signs corresponds to a difference in the mode of presentation of that which is designated, right? So when I said bachelor versus unmarried male, what I seem to have there is a difference in the way in which I'm presenting my thought, right? So what we have here is that what we can say is that when the, the every word or every has a sign, and every sign has two parts of it. It has a sense and it has a reference. Now a sense is something that can, can possess a name. And a referent is something to which a name can refer, right? So the most famous example that Frigga has of this is the morning star and the evening star. Now, what is the, the morning star is, I don't know if you've ever heard of this phrase. Many people have it, but the morning star refers to the planet Venus. And here's Venus. And ironically, the evening star also is a phrase that's used to refer to Venus, um, and I think that has to do with the idea that early in the morning you can see Venus on the horizon and the same thing in the, in the early evening, uh, if I'm not wrong, right? 
So the morning star and the evening star both refer to the same planet. So we have a similar sort of problem we had before. We have two different ways of saying something, but they both ultimately are referring to the same thing. And now you can get, let me go backwards. Now you can get a sense of what the sense reference distinction is. So what we can say is that uh, we have that the sign, that if we take the sign being the, the morning star, that has its sense, but it has the same referent as the evening star, right? So there's two different ways in which we can talk about the same thing being the case. Let me, sorry, I keep going up and down. I just love this picture of Venus. Um, but the, why is this important for his logic ultimately, right? The reason it's so important for his logic is because in his systematic logic, for what Frege does is he formalizes through, symbol, through symbolic mechanism uh, the relationship that our la that our words have with each other when we make categorical statements or or not or just basic propositional statements. Um, the problem, though, is that in his system, right, it's assumed that if you make a statement, that statement means just that, and nothing else also means that. And the problem with this one of the the paradox, one of the elements that eventually comes out of this paradox and his system is that his system is actually sort of unable ultimately to make sense of these sorts of problems. The problems where the morning star and the evening star mean the same thing despite having very different senses, right? So you can say is that there's two different senses for the same reference. Now a sense does not necessarily have a reference in reality. That's important. So if I say the current king of France, right, that has a sense because it's a, it's a statement, right? But it doesn't have a referent because there is no current king of France. So this is a very important element to recognize that our language also, not only can our language be so multifarious that we can use different senses to refer to the same referent, we can even talk about things for which there is no referent whatsoever. So we can as it were have signs that just refer to other signs. Now a referent can be, but is not necessarily a definite object, right? Because a referent could potentially be someone else's sign and so on and so forth. Here's two quotations to leave you with, or not to leave you with, but to give you. Number one, the regular connection between a sign, its sense, and its referent is of such a kind that to the sign there corresponds a definite sense and to that in turn a definite referent. While to a given referent, an object, there does not belong only a single sign. And, that, and then a little bit later on that same page of 27, he says, to every expression belonging to a complete totality of signs, there should certainly correspond a definite sense, but language often doesn't satisfy this condition, and one must be seen, I'm sorry, one must be content if the same word has the same sense in the same context. So here we have this sort of interesting suggestion or a comment that I think will become important for us later, especially when we look at the philosophical work of Ludwig Wittgenstein, which is namely that if it, according to the way in which Frege is trying to create really a systematic logical taxonomy for language here, right? Ultimately, every expression should have a definite referent, should correspond, I'm sorry, should have a definite sense. Um, but the problem is, is that language doesn't actually always do this. And what we're left with is we, we use our words in all these different contexts. So what I want you to take pay, pay close, close attention to here is the way in which Frege's articulation of sense and reference ultimately bumps up against the messiness of language. It bumps up against the idea that our language is not just something that, it, that is about the world, but it seems to be something that's fundamentally tied up with the world in terms of context. This will be important when we get to uh, Wittgenstein's discussion of language later. What we can say is that this is, reveals the imperfection of human language. And this, for instance, becomes really, I would say, is the modern problem of logic, at least in this early, modern, or this early period of uh, modern philosophy or contemporary philosophy. Um, and that's the notion that our language so, simply doesn't seem to be up to the task of, of talking about the world in a systematic way that we would like to have. Um, not in the way in which we seem to be able to arrive at this in mathematics. Though I should say, Frege even said that the same problem, the sense reference problem, also exists within mathematics. Um, so he, though it's not as definite in the same way. Um, now there's many different forms of a sign, for instance, that, that he takes note of. For instance, consider quotations. So for instance, 
I maybe I've assigned for my ethics class. I've assigned my students to write a paper on John Stuart Mill's utilitarianism, and potentially maybe um, they quote the very famous passage of John Stuart Mill where he says, "It's better to be Socrates dissatisfied than to be a pig that is satisfied." Now that's a quotation. What is a quotation when we think about the sense reference distinction? Well, the answer is is that a quotation is the sign of another sign, <laughs> right? Um, and and the and so it's a sign of a sign of a reference that John that John Stuart Mill was making. Take the other example of a report. What exactly is a report when we think about this sense reference distinction? Well, what Frege suggests is that a report is really an indirect referent. Um, it's a way of pointing out what the referent of a statement is, but indirectly because you have to report on it. You're not actually observing it or uh, or recognizing it yourself. And we're at least we're talking about it in the way in which we have a direct referent. So what this means is that, um, or one of the, the consequences of this, is that the sense reference of a sign is not a concept, right? So you can ask, well, we have concepts. In, in this essay, it seems to me, and I'll have to be honest, I'm not a Frankian scholar, but it seems to me in this essay, um, although I know that there's a, there's a great essay on function and concept where Frege articulates what he means by a concept, to relate it to this earlier essay we were looking at a thought, what we can say is that the sense reference of a sign is not the thought. It's not the object of a thought. Um, and it, or it's not, nor is it an idea, right? The sense sign reference is not a concept. He says, quote, the conception is subjective. One man's conception is not that of another. Okay, so I may have misspoke there. Um, I think what he means by concept is what he talks about as being an idea in our earlier essay. He goes on. Quote, just as one man connects this conception and another conception with the same word, so also one man can associate this sense and another with that sense. So if two persons conceive the same, each still has their own conception. Now that means that, so that's really quite interesting. So uh, that means that the sense reference distinction here really concerns about the mechanics and the structure of the way meaning operates. Um, which isn't the same thing as talking about the way in which our ideas and our concepts operate. Now, uh, there's there's sort of three different levels that we could apply the sense reference distinction to. One would be words, like the word bachelor. Other would be expressions, like unmarried man. Or whole sentences, like he is an unmarried man. Uh, so at each one of those levels, we see the sense, we see different senses uh, potentially with the same reference, potentially with no reference, or potentially with different reference. Uh, but it's important to recognize these sort of distinct levels of analysis that are possible. Now let's ask this question. Since it's possible to have a sense without a reference, what about a de declarative sentence? Well, give this, uh, Frege gives the example of the, that Odysseus was set ashore in Ithaca while sound asleep. Now that is a sentence that has a definite sense Right, Odysseus was a person who they left him on the beach while he was asleep in Ithaca. Um, but you can see there is that what we have is a definite sense, so we know what's happening. But you can see, what about the referent? There we we have difficulty because the the referent there, to Odysseus, does that refer to a real person or not? It, probably not. Or if it does refer to a real person, not a person who was left on shore in Ithaca while sound asleep like the Homeric poem would indicate. So you can see here is that as soon as we start to recognize the Odysseus element, notice Odysseus is a word that has its own referent, and then the rest of it is also a sense for something that happens to Odysseus. He says, quote, the thought loses value for us as soon as we recognize that the referent or one of its parts is missing. And there's a psychology, uh, not psychology, a phraseology here that, that I think Frege is beginning to develop, and that's Number one is a proper name, which expresses its sense, but it refers uh, to or designates its own referent. But there's also a declarative sentence, which contains a thought. Um, and the thought is the object, right? So sentences can use different words to refer to the same thing. That is, sentences can use different words or expressions to refer to the same thought. They have the same object, uh, but they have different senses. Now, the truth of a the truth value of a sentence is its referent. And this is actually, I think, Frege's core thesis in the essay, though I think most people who read the essay really just focus on the basic setup of between sense and reference. His view here is that 
what exactly is the referent of a declarative sentence? Let's say, uh, when I say that Donald Trump is the current president of the United States, what's the referent of that sentence? It's sort of weird, exactly. Um, it's clear that Donald Trump is a person, and there's a referent to Donald Trump, there's a referent to the presidency, but what about this complex of things? What you can see here is that the truth value is the referent, or at least that's his suggestion. He says, quote, Subject and predicate, which are understood in the, in the classic logical sense, are indeed elements of thought, right? They stand on the same level for knowledge. And by combining subjects and predicates, one reaches only a thought, but never passes from a sense to its referent, never from a thought to its truth value. Now, one moves at the same level, but never advances from one level to the next. So, a truth value cannot be part of a thought any more than, say, the sun can, for it is not a sense, but an object, right? And so that means that what is a judgment? Well, a judgment, therefore, is when we move from a thought to the truth value. Um, so the referent of a sense is not always its truth value, though, right? So he makes this suggestion that the truth value can actually be the referent of a declarative sense, but he says that's not always the case. For instance, what if someone says, it seems to me that Donald Trump is the president of the United States? Well, it seems to me indicates the provisionality, right? Which means that there is no truth value there. Uh, because there you're saying that you're not sure, essentially, but that you're indicating what you think. Um, so that means that the reference sentence is not always its truth value, despite his suggestion that a truth value can operate as a referent. Now, there is a, there's a deeper reason why ultimately Frank is arguing this, and again, it has to go back to his defense for the arithmetic, uh, the foundations of arithmetic, and ultimately his concept script and his logical system. Now, let's go forward here. One thing we can notice here is that what happens when we replace uh, the, a word with another phrase? Because what we're going to see is that when you replace one sentence, one sentence with another that has the same truth value, that doesn't always guarantee that you have the same the identity of the same referent. So take this first example. Um, someone says, Columbus inferred from the roundness of the earth that he could reach India by traveling toward the west. Now, let's take this word, the earth, and let's replace it with this little phrase here. right? So, so now the sentence reads, Columbus inferred from the roundness of the planet which is accompanied by a moon whose diameter is greater than the fourth part of its own, that he could reach India by traveling towards the west. Now take a look here. We have what looks like two of the sentences that look the same. Except the first sentence has the earth, and the, sen the second sentence has the planet which is accompanied by a moon whose diameter is greater than the fourth part of its own. Now we know that the earth is the same as the planet which is accompanied by a moon whose diameter blank, blank, and blank. We know they're the same thing, but you can see here is that the sentence is very different because Columbus inferred from the roundness of the earth Columbus did not infer from the astronomical data about the moon and its relationship to the earth that you could reach India by traveling to the west. So you can see here is that these, these two sentences, despite saying the same thing, and ultimately, or they don't say the same thing, but, but despite having very similar senses, right, have different reference consequent to the way in which that, that uh, subject phrase was, was made. Another example, he who discovered the elliptical form of the planetary orbits died in misery, right? So in this sentence, the referent of the sentence is not a truth value. The referent is Kepler, right? Because Kepler is the person who discovered the elliptical form, and he's the person who died in misery. So there's another example that the truth value thesis that Frege offers us here is not always the case, right? And how does Frege deal with this? Because Frege ultimately wants to wrap up a nice systematic, uh, he wants to have a nice systematic uh, uh, argument or theory for meaning. His argument, his response is that, well, human language is incomplete, right? He says, quote, a logically complete language, such as the Begrishrift, should satisfy, satisfy the conditions that every expression, grammatically well-constructed as a proper name out of signs, already introduced shall in fact designate an object, and that no new sign shall be introduced as a proper name without having a referent assured. So we have a very, I think, sort of puzzling suggestion or response by Frege.
works, which is that Frege seems to suggest that the problem is not his theory, the problem is human language, right? Human language itself is incomplete, and that's why we end up with, uh, as it were, the, this problem that even though the truth value of a statement is the referent, you have these other sorts of uses of language that don't fit that model, right? So, which is sort of kind of, you can tell he's frustrated, I think he's frustrated by uh, the analysis here. Now, what about hypothetical thoughts, right? Think about when you, you say, you make a hypothesis, if this was the case, then this will be the case, and, and so on and so forth. Well, he says that a hypothetical thought is something which establishes a reciprocal, a reciprocal relationship between two thoughts, right? If this thought occurs, then this thought will occur. And you see there's a, there's a reciproc reciprocality in a reciprocal relationship. Now, if you want to get, if you wanted to zoom ahead, the very last section of the Sense and Reference essay, pages 46 to 50, uh, really go through the review of the problem where he lays out everything that I've mentioned so far in this video. So if you, if you So I would encourage you, if you haven't read the essay and you don't have time to read it all, go to these pages and read his conclusion. Um, but I do want to end our video by um, uh, with Frege by really encouraging you to think about the idea that Frege's theory and it's sort of like a shipwreck on the beach. He has these suggestions, but for every uh, thesis he gives, for instance, the most important thesis, I think, after he articulates the sense reference dichotomy, is the idea that the truth value of a sense is its referent. That's not always true, right? And in response to that, Frege says, well, it's hard to exhaust all the possibilities that are given by language, but, and he goes on to defend his position. The reason I'm sort of ending the, the discussion here is what I want you to see here is that Frege, on the one hand, is analyzing what it means to think, what it means to have ideas, analyzing the, the complex structure that our ideas have in terms of sense, reference, our concepts, and our thoughts. But it's clear that, that despite his systematicity, there is something that our language is unable to capture. Um, and I want to, this is the end of our first video in this series of contemporary philosophy, because I want to suggest to you that what we're going to see in the foregoing videos and in the foregoing discussions with these various philosophers is that contemporary philosophy is ultimately, I think, in a certain way, trying to articulate the um, exhaustibility of the, is tr let's put it this way, that is trying to articulate the exhaustibility of the inexhaustible. And there's a way in which meaning sort of overflows and goes beyond our ability to grasp it, despite that we grasp things as meaningful. Uh, and so that is our first discussion in contemporary philosophy, looking at Gottlob Frege's sense and reference, as well as a thought um, in his discussion of thinking. Thank you very much for watching this video, um, and I'll see you guys next time. We take a look at a philosopher who has a very, very similar set of problems, and that is Edmund Husserl. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you guys online.